progressive assurance. Progressive assurance. If you'd open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 12 today, and we're going to read two verses of Scripture. Amen. In Romans chapter 12, and we're going to begin with verse number 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service of spiritual worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to draw particular attention to verse 2, the very end of it. it. And it says that you may prove what is the good. Everybody say good. good. And acceptable. Everybody say acceptable. And perfect will of God. Say perfect will of God. Well, this is what we all want or should be striving for, right? In other words, the will of God. We should be all striving for the will of God in our life. And sometimes the question is, what is the will of God? Well, we'll find that the simplest way to define the will of God is to know that the will of God is the Word of God. Whatever God says in His Word is His will, because His Word is Him talking to us. And the truth is, until we take God that way, we really will not receive anything from God. Satan's number one attempt will always be to get you to question and doubt the Word of God. Because he knows that only the Word defeats him, Satan. Only the Word of God gives you faith. And if he can downplay the Word of God and convince you that the Word is something other than God talking to us or God's will for our lives, then we are already defeated before we are ever started. So let me explain today why I'm calling this message uh, today progressive assurance. I didn't call it progressive insurance. You've seen plenty of those commercials. But assurance. In other words, progressive assurance. So let me tell you why. Because the word, let's do it by defining both words. First, progressive means happening or developing gradually or in stages. I will say it again. Progressive means happening or developing gradually or in stages. It means proceeding step by step. And really, that is how we grow in God, step by step. Faith by fa faith to faith, glory to glory, victory to victory, the scripture says. Amen. So it's we we progress. It's progressive. Our walk with God is progressive. It's gradually, if it's done right, it's gradually moving forward. In other words, it's how we grow in God step by step. Remember the, script, the psalmist said it is that uh, uh, the, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. A lot of times we want it to be the leaps, but I find out this, that the steps are safe, that God have laid out for us. And a lot of times people try to get ahead of God and that is where they get into problems. And most of us, if we just learn to walk step by step in this progression, then we will be safe. Amen. And so, uh, the word progressive, we've defined. Now let's look at the word assurance. In its simplest form, it means a promise. The word assurance means a promise, but it also means a positive declaration intended to give confidence. I'll say that again. It means a promise or it means a pos positive declaration intended to give confidence. How many know that's exactly what God does with His Word? His Word is a promise. Come on. His Word is is a promise, are you, right? are you understand? That produces confidence when known and believed in in our lives. When we know and believe on a promise 
then something happens in our life. Amen. It, his word is a promise that produces confidence when known and believed in in our lives, which in turn causes us to grow in God step by step in His will. Everybody say, in His will. And actually, in His good and His acceptable and in His perfect will. I'm going to say all that again. His word is a promise that produces confidence when known and believed on in our lives, causes us to grow in God step by step in His will, which is His good, acceptable, and perfect will for our lives. His progressive will is our progressive assurance. In other words, let me say it another way. Our faith grows or our assurance grows in God through His promises or through His Word. How many know that's how our faith grows? We are assured through the promise. We are assured through every promise of God. That's how our faith grows. It's impossible to claim, boldly claim by faith a blessing that you do not know God offers. This is why it's so important we know the Word of God. Because with the promise comes the assurance. Amen. God gives us His promises and through our understanding of them, our faith grows. Because of that, we actually take both steps toward and in His will for our lives. You get that? I want to say that again. Because of that, because of what? Because of His promises. Because we have assurance of His promise. We actually take both steps toward and in His will for our lives. Because we must remember faith or when I say faith, I mean true faith in God begins where the will of God is known. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So let's look back today. I've introduced this, this message that we will actually not finish today, but we'll, we'll finish next week entitled Pro Progressive Assurance. How many know that God wants us growing in faith? How many know it's possible to grow in faith? The Scripture says, Paul wrote by inspiration of the Spirit of God to the church there at Thessalonica that, that he told them that their faith grew exceedingly. Amen. And obviously, faith can grow because Jesus talked about great faith, but he also talked about weak faith. So how many know... That it's really not up to God, if we didn't know, it's not up to God whether we have weak faith or strong faith. It's up to us. By knowing, by knowing what God's promise or His assurance is to us, and through knowing it and believing it, our faith becomes growing. Or we have a progressive assurance in His Word or in the promise of God. And then from that place, the important thing is that we grow in the will of God that what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now next week, it's really important because I want to I give some practical examples about us growing in the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. What that looks like, what that means, how important that is to our life. But in starting today, uh, what we want to do is lay a foundation that is important for us to get there. So let's begin once again by reading in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. What does that mean? It means that as a believer, you offer your life a living sacrifice. In other words, you don't do as a believer, our life is not our own. What God is exhorting us is that when we got saved, it's like enlisting in the army. But we're in God's army. And if, if for any people that have enlisted in the army, how many know that when you are in the military, the military pretty well owns you while you're in there? In other words, you, get, you take your direction from them. 
Well, God gives us that same. He says, we're bought with a price. Glorify God in our body and in our spirits, which are God's. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, what we find out here, he says that we're to present as believers. Hallelujah. We offer our lives or present our bodies a living sacrifice or offering. In other words, listen, sacrifices are something that were presented to God under the Old Testament. Amen. They killed that sacrifice as an act of worship and obedience to God. God received worship from that. God says, you're going to be a living sacrifice. In other words, with your body, you're going to present it on the altar of obedience to do the will of God with your life, not your will anymore. Everybody say, ouch. How many know the knife you put in, your, in it, in your life, is the one that you do? In other words, the, the denying of your own self, the right to do what you used to do or what you even want to do with your life. Now, your life belongs to God. That doesn't mean God is trying to take all our fun away or take everything away that, we'll, that we enjoy. That's not what it's saying at all. It's saying in order to do the will of God, you're going to have to obey me. And through obedience, you're going to get to a place where you are not only in the good, the acceptable, but the perfect will of God. And that's the place where not only are the blessings going to flow, but really what I want to do in your life, you're going to make the greatest impact. You're going to have the greatest joy and the greatest fulfillment through that place. But see, I know even now, as I talked about that, that in the mind of most, they debate that because Satan sits here and says, well, that can't be so because uh, God is just trying to take... I don't even going to hear anything the pastor has to say because God's going to try to take all the, way, all the fun away from me. No, God would take all the sin away. The very things we sang about today, breaking those heavy chains and the things that once held us away from God, His will, and His purpose for our life, those things are destroyed. But we get in, in, and those things being destroyed, we get a brand new life in Christ. Sometimes people wonder, they say, well, I have a problem with sin. It's either because of this, you haven't come to Christ yet, or you don't know what Christ's sacrifice has done to break those dirty chains off of you. So we got to learn both. we got to learn not only what He did, and through knowing what He did, we can receive Christ. And by receiving Christ, we get a brand new nature on the inside. And by knowing what this new nature did, it gives us power to say no to sin, no to the world, no to the flesh, and no to the devil. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So these are pretty important. God said, here's how it works. We're going to have to present our bodies. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. One translation says, it's the spiritual way for which you worship. You know, we think that in our mind, in one way this would be most definitely true. We come in on a Sunday morning and we worship God. We, we lift our hands or we stand there, we sing, we participate. We hopefully in tune our hearts with God, talk to Him from our hearts, not just our heads. And we allow our bodies to be part of that sacrifice is where we lift our hands and we open our voice and we, we participate. We use our bodies as an instrument of righteousness. To be presented before God. Now we have to learn to do all this. And this is why the Bible instructs us to do this. Because when you got saved or when you got born again, the inward man of you changed. You got a new nature. But your mind and your body did not change. If you were five foot seven or eight like I am, you were five foot seven or eight after you got saved. I say it like this to wake everybody up. If you had a booger in your nose before you got saved, you got a booger in your nose after you got saved. If you had blind hair, let's put it a little bit nicer. If you had blind hair when you got saved, when you, before you got saved, you'll have blind hair after you got saved. Your outward man, your body did not change. What changed of you when you got saved is the spirit of man, the inward man, your heart. Your spirit, you, because you are a spirit being, an eternal spirit being. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 tells us we are spirits, we possess a soul, soul, mind, will, intellect, and emotion, 
if we live in a body. And mind, will, intellect, and emotion in our bodies haven't changed when we got saved. This is why this portion of Scripture is instructing us to do something with our bodies and something with our minds. We're first talking about doing something with your body. Because until you learn to do something with your body, you won't worship God. You know, you come to church, until you learn to do something with your body, don't let your body rule you. You do something with your body. You make your body do and become what it says it's supposed to be, an instrument of righteousness at the disposal of God. A child of God, amen, who actually is a sacrifice. Your body becomes a sacrifice. We know when we stand here and we lift up our hands and we, we know that's worship, but God says it's when you throughout the day and throughout your life don't let your body do what it wants to do. Let you, and, and, and you make your body do what God said to do. He says every time you do that, that's a worship. That's worship. Because you're sacrificing before God. In other words, you, it's, a, it's a sacrifice before God. In other words, if your beady little eyes want to look at the wrong thing, then you say, no eyes, you don't go there. They don't belong, that doesn't belong to me anymore. These eyes belong to God. So I refuse to look at things that are, that are ungodly or my eyes shouldn't see, like pornography or someone else that, you know what I'm saying, something that don't belong to you. Whoo, pastor, now you're going to meddling. Well, we butter metal in church because too much, too less has been said, and, and and people walk away powerless and ineffective because nobody shoots them straight. Amen. And the truth is, this is written to Christians just like you and I that have made Jesus Christ the Lord of life, and they came out uh, the, the, the Roman culture. If you know what's in the Roman culture, they had all the vices we got today, and 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 and, and possibly as bad or worse. They have the same stuff. And Paul had to remind them, now that you're saved, you can't let your body do what it wants to do. Now you have to, you, your spirit, has to, by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within it, tell your body no. Tell your body no. Tell your body no. It doesn't, you, your body is not the real you. Your body is a vehicle that gets you around here on this earth. All right, so let's read this from another translation, and it may help us a little bit. So, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we'll read it from the Passion Translation. It says, Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourself to God to be a sacred, living sacrifices. And live in holiness, experiencing all that delights His heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. You know, let me, you know what he said in short? Living right is the expression of worship to God. Did you know that as we live right before God, that's an expression of worship? Our life is a living sacrifice, and God accepts that as worship before Him. Matter of fact, if we don't do that worship well, we ain't going to do this worship well when we come in here because it'll be more of a farce than it will be anything else. That we're trying, we're struggling, we can all that. But the point is, God is trying to tell us how we can get where He wants us to be in His good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Isn't that right? So, when we do this through the transforming power of the gospel and through the new birth, then what happens, we go where He wants to go. He, we go where He wants us to go. We do what He wants us to do. We be what He wants us to be, amen, and we say what He wants us to say. Because once again, living right is an expression of worship before God. Let's look at a couple other portions that will build our faith to know what God says about us as new creations and what we can do because we're new creations. Listen, you're not who, if you're saved, you're not who you used to be. You are a new creation. Old things are passed away. The old sin nature is passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you're struggling with that, it's only because you don't know it or you don't know how to walk in it. And until we do what verse 2 tells us, which we'll read in a moment, called the renewing of our mind, we will always struggle. 
Because we're going to have to not only do something with that body that we're talking about, we're going to have to do something with our mind. And that's going to be key of us, what we do with our bodies. Amen. Now let's read this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. We're going to read it from the Passion Translation. It says, Since Christ, though innocent, suffered in the flesh for you. Who did He suffer for? For you and I. Now you also must be a prepared soldier. Having the same mindset, for whoever has died in his body is done with sin. So live the rest of your earthly life no longer concerned with human desires, but be consumed with what brings pleasure to God. See, God is not, once again, God is not trying to steal our fun. God is trying to let us know that we can actually live a brand new life, the one He's called us to live, and it can produce great joy and great peace and above all else, great freedom in our life. Freedom. Everybody say freedom. Freedom. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now let's look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 together. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 through 11. And we're going to read it again from the Passion Translation. Everybody doing all right? Are you tracking with me? If you'll track with me for a few more moments, I can assure you, you will be helped in this place today. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. We're going to read. Could it be any clearer that our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power? Let's stop right there. Your former identity. Who, in other words, who you used to be. Before you got saved, who you used to be is dead and gone. You have a former identity. Listen, as a believer, not only do you have a natural identity, but you have a spiritual identity. And your old spiritual identity has been addressed by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And who you used to be is not who you are. The reason you and I can do for God what we never done before is because you and I are who we never been before. Woo! Glory to God. Notice it says, Hallelujah. Could it be any clearer? Well, he's asking that for a question. That our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power. For we were co-crucified with him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us. So that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. That's what gets us in, that's what gets us in, 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 in trouble. You know why? Because sin always produces death. Obviously, a dead person is incapable of sinning. And if we were crucified with the anointed one, we know that we will also share in the fullness of his life. Now notice, it says a dead person is incapable of sinning. You know, I'm not trying to be gross. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to make a point. You know, a person that's in the casket and they're, and they're, and they're dead, you could come up to them. You could spit on them. That's not right. I'm just telling you, you could pinch them, you could say, you ugly thing, you, you got what you deserve. You could say all those kind of things, but you're not going to affect them. You know why? Because they're dead. You could pinch them. You could laugh at them, thinking you're hurting them. You ain't hurting them, you hurt yourself. They, why, why? Because they're dead. They, they're incapable of being, having a response to that. The Scripture is telling us that through being co-crucified with Christ, that's how the power of sin is not only broken off of life, but we can actually walk through life and say, when things tempt us, say, no, you're dead. I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. I died to that. When temptation comes and all the stuff, I've died died to that. I'm dead to that. Now, I told this story, and I think it bears repeating. One one of the best stories I've ever heard that drive this point home is uh, anybody ever remember uh, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price? He's gone, gone home to be with the Lord. When Pastor Debbie and I got saved in 1986, we listened to a lot of his teaching, read, read a lot of his books. What a wonderful man of God that he was. i never forget he talked about him and his wife uh, going on vacation one time. And uh, they were at the beach, and, and all of a sudden he woke up. Well, he turned over, and there was someone, he felt the sand or something stirring around him. So he turned around and turned over. And instead of being his wife, it was another woman, and she was scarcely dressed. And she was kind of looking down over him. He's looking up, and he, he said, this is what I said. He said, you dead, Fred, you dead, Fred, you dead, Fred. 
You get, you get the idea? You dead, Fred. Come on. You better address it. In other words, you reckon yourself dead to sin, but alive to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to count yourself that way. You have to say, you have to tell yourself, no, 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 you don't go there. That don't belong to you. This is what this is saying. For we were, once again, we were co-crucified with Him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. Obviously, a dead person is incapable of sinning. If you really consider yourself dead to sin, he says a dead person is incapable of sinning. He's given that illustration. And if we were co-crucified with the anointed one, we know that we will also share in the fullness of his life or his power. And we, have, and we know that since... The anointed one has been raised from the dead to die no more. His resurrection life has vanquished death and its power over him is finished. Praise God. For by his sacrifice, he died to sin's power once and for all. But he now lives continually for the Father's pleasure. So let it be the same way with you. Since you are now joined with him... You must continually view yourself as dead and unresponsive to sin's appeal while living daily for God's pleasure in union with Jesus, the Anointed One. Isn't that powerful? Now see, here's the problem that we we have here. I see this when we read this. It says that we we must continue to view ourselves as dead. you got to count yourself dead. Consider it. And unresponsive to sin's appeal. So when your head wants to turn and look at something, you say, I ain't turning. I ain't looking at that. No, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm a new creature in Christ. And you keep walking and you keep thanking God for whatever. Or whatever's coming your way that, that, you, that don't belong to you, you don't supposed to be dealing with. And unresponsive to sin's appeal, but notice, while living daily for God's pleasure and union with Jesus Christ. So here's where most Christians miss it at. They're so concerned about what they don't supposed to be doing when if we will learn to live in union with Christ and what we're supposed to be doing, the attraction of everything else won't be as great. In other words, if we're always fighting what we don't supposed to do instead of living from the place of, God, what you tell me to do? And go about doing it. And go on about doing it. And while you're going about doing it, those are the things that are real to you. And it's easy to say no when those other things pop up. But if we're always fighting from the defensive, like, oh, 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 I got to be perfect before I do something for God. No, you start doing what God said in His will. And as you're doing that, you're empowered. And then these things pop up. It's easy to say, no, no, I resist that. No, I don't do that anymore. Uh-uh. I'm, when you're busy about the Father's business, how many know those things that come up don't adore you like they once did? But if all we're trying to do is fight to stay away from and, and, and never do what God said. See, we got to act in the offense, church. We got to be doing what God says to do. How many know praying and reading the word and, and witnessing and sharing our faith? As we live for Him, it's going to be easy to say no. But if you're always saying, Oh, I've always got to, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do the other, I can't. Then we all messed up. Come on. With the power of, this is what this is saying, with the power of sin destroyed off of our lives and we receiving a new nature, God's, we have power over sin to say no, to reject it, and throw off any weight, any sin that easily besets us, and then we're able easily to take steps in God's will for our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a lot more that we could say, but let's look at verse 2. For time's sake today, look at verse 2. Then, we're going to read from the uh, King James Version verse. It says, and be not conformed. What translation says, stop being shaped by the world. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Have we transformed? By the renewing of your mind. 
Now see, all of us when I say transformed, if I say transformer, then the majority of the people in here, young and old alike, would know what I'm talking about. You know, you see the, the movie Transformers and all those kind of action figures and everything or whatever. But what this word means is, this Greek word means the same thing. It means this. It's actually, the, the Greek word is uh, metamorpho, which we get our, our English word metamorphosis from. So in other words, it's like we were, we're we, we, God takes us as an ugly caterpillar. And I know some people think caterpillars are really pretty. But God takes the ugly caterpillar and turns that caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. That is what this word means. That we're transformed, we're changed by the renewing of our mind. That we may notice through the renewing of mind that we may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So as we think about this, we need to, to stop being shaped or pressed into a mold by the world's order, one translation says. One translation says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. We may talk a little bit more about that uh, next week. But here's what we want to focus on this week. We want to talk about this where it says that, but we are transformed by of the renewing of our mind. What translation, what translation says is by a new way of thinking. You know as believers, you're going to have to think differently. In order to be in order, you will never be a successful Christian and fulfill the plan of God for your life or even begin to walk in the will of God without changing the way you think. Because you're going to have to think the way God thinks in order to be successful. Because the, re, the word renew means to, ex, to, to change or exchange or to change or exchange your way of thinking for God's way of thinking. You know, the Scripture says, how can two walk together unless they agree? Amos 3.3. 3. So unless we agree with what God says, we can't even walk together in a relationship. Oh, we think, was, you know, we say stuff like this, oh, me and God are like this, we're, we're tight like this, but it's all those people that are the problem. The how many know you got a problem right there? Because God says we're to love our neighbor as ourself. Now I get and understand what you're saying, but a lot of times our problem is hung up. It's about a six-inch spot in our life that's causing us to trip up. It's the space between our two ears. Stink, it's called stinking thinking. Anybody ever had stinking thinking besides Pastor Chris? Amen. This is why it says we're going to have to renew our mind, exchange our way of thinking for God's way of thinking. And it, it, means, to, it means a continual change. A continual change. That means this. You could have... You see, now let me, let, me, let me say this real quick. We think that our mind is renewed because we know what the Bible says. But the Bible teaches us our mind isn't really changed until we do what we know that God said. So it's not enough to say it's, it's a step in the right direction and say, oh, I know the Bible says that. But our minds aren't really renewed until we're doing what we know the Bible says. That's how we change. That's how we know we change. It's not until we do what we know that makes a difference in our life. So knowing is important. Faith begins where the will of God is known. But just because we know it, does it it's the beginning. We work that out. By acting on that. And we do that by renewing our mind, exchanging our way of thinking uh, for God's way of thinking. It means to retrain, renew means to retrain your mind to think in line with God's word. Hallelujah. That's what it means. Now let's read this from the Passion Translation 12.2. In the Passion Translation it says it like this. It says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. Ooh, that just, got, that just got most of us in trouble. No, that's some good instruction right there. You know, until we don't allow the culture around us to influence us, and allow God... See, we need Jesus' culture, not the culture. See, what do you mean culture, Pastor? In other words, the beliefs and behaviors you have are formed by the culture you believe. So we need Jesus' culture. That's what this is saying. Stop imitating the deals and opinions of the culture around you. 
oh, you know, the, the culture of the world today say, oh, this is outdated. This, this is outdated. You're square if you believe this. You're stupid if you believe this. You're, you're old-fashioned if you believe this. You know, we're more progressive. Oh, I'll talk some more about that next week, maybe. <clears throat> Just throw that out. Stop, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. But be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. Total reformation of how you think. So here's the, here's the thing. We got, so we start thinking about us as new creatures in Christ. We're thinking about our identity in Christ. We got that down. We start waking up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, that man or that woman has God living in them. Woo! Glory to God. And we, we, we get and set our feet on the ground and we say, oh, glory to God, I'm a new creature in Christ. Lord, thank you for making me a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Be old, all things have become new. And we begin to live like new creatures in there until we get to church on Sunday morning and the pastor starts talking about giving. Then we find out that our mind not be, might not be renewed in every area yet. Or on Wednesday morning, Pastor Debbie and the healing center start talking about healing. And we say, well, you know, I, I just think that sometimes God heals people when He wants to and sometimes He don't. Well, give me a scripture and verse for that. It's not in the Word. See, you find out this... That we need a total transformation, and that's going to be a lifelong process. This is why we go to church, because it's a school you go to to relearn how to live again, and you don't graduate till you die. And your pastor is the instructor today to tell you some things that help you to live this new transformed life. Through the total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will for your life. God's will as you live a, a, what kind of life? A beautiful life. God's will, make no mistake about it, will always cause us to live a beautiful life. Yes, it will. Satisfying and perfect in His eyes. Woo, glory to God. That's a pretty good progression right there. That's progressive assurance. So, we see here that we'll be able to discern, to know, or to see God's will for our life. How are we going to get that? It comes through one way, by renewing our mind to the Word of God. This is how it comes. And you know, when we renew our mind to the Word of God, it's going to cause some not only aha moments like, aha like this, oh my Lord, Father, thank you so much. Thank you. I found out what your will is for my life, and I embrace that. You want to do that for me? I love you, and I praise you, and I thank you for it. But it's also going to be some aha moments that says, oh, you want me to stop doing that? You mean I don't supposed to do that no more? You mean lying is wrong? You mean stealing is wrong? Oh, come on now. We think that, that is, that's what everybody knows, that everybody... Uh, anybody with, with common sense knows that, but why is the Bible written to tell us steal no more? Lie not to his neighbor one, one to another. Come on. It says those things because not everybody's where you're at and we all need to know what we're supposed to be doing. This is why it addresses these things. So once again, how are we transformed? How are we changed? We're changed by... By retraining our mind to think in line with God's Word. It, renew means to exchange or to, to change or exchange our way of thinking for God's way. And how many know God's way is God's what? Will or His Word. How do we know what to think? Well, we find out what God's Word says. This is why we're going to have to be in this book. This is why we've got to be in this book. Let me tell you another reason why you're going to need to be in this book. Because if you're not in this book, you will be deceived. You'll be deceived by the devil, by selfish and designing people, and you will be an unsuccessful Christian, even though you are a Christian. You will be unsuccessful, and that is not God's will, because God is telling us <clears throat> so that we know and see what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In other words, <clears throat> so that we know what the progressive will is or becomes our progressive assurance. God's Word is God's will. As we accept it for our lives, we take 
progressive steps both towards His perfect will and in His will for our life. Now you said towards His perfect will and in His will for our life. Now listen, in 1986 when I got saved, I knew a little bit about God's perfect will. It was off in the distance somewhere. I took steps as I obeyed God towards that, but as I walked towards that, I took steps in the will of God I knew. Like reading the Bible, praying every day, coming to church, presenting my body a living sacrifice, renewing my mind. Without doing these steps daily, I will never get to the perfect thing that I knew in my heart, that, or at least where a part of that perfect thing was for me off in the future. This is why I said <coughs> this, <coughs> as we accept <coughs> God's Word in our lives, be in His will, we take progressive steps both towards His perfect will and in His will for our lives. This is how important it is for us to understand what Romans 12, 1 and 2 is telling us. It is part of God's progressive assurance for our life, which enables us to walk in His plan and His will for our life. Now next week, we're going to pick right back up here. This is a good place to stop. We're going to pick up next week, and we're going to talk more about this progressive assurance, and we're going to look at what it means, the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We're going to look at that, and what that means to our life, and how we can actually get there. You think that would be all right? Now just for a moment, we are going to receive communion. But in closing today, let's talk about a few things that we are all affected by, by God's will, that we can definitely know is God's will for us all. <clears throat> let's talk about it for one moment. Can we? Let's talk about something that we all should be able to agree on is God's will because God's Word tells us this is for everybody. This is for everybody. It's God's will that every lost person is saved, number one. Every lost person is saved. That's God's will. Well, you say, Pastor Chris, I thought that for something that is God's will, it will automatically happen. That's wrong thinking. And the Bible tells us exactly opposite of that. It tells us what the will of God is so that you and I can know the will of God and then walk towards the will of God and receive the will of God. God tells us what His will is so we can receive His will, but His will is never automatic in our life. And we will find that everybody in this room, it is God's will, this is affects everybody in this room, that it is God's will. His Word tells us, he wills none be, none be lost, all come to repentance. He will all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So it is God's will that every lost person would be saved. That's His will. Why isn't everybody saved then? Well, it's because people have to receive His Son. In other words, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever would believe on Him or receive Him... To them He gave the power to become the sons of God. So in other words, I combine two scripture verses there. Uh, uh, John chapter 3, 6, 3, 16 and John 1, 12. So what that means is this. God gave His Son as a sacrifice for all of our sin. For every sinner, Christ died for us so that we could be saved. But how we get saved is there has to be a time in our life that we actually accept that sacrifice as our own. We actually repent of our sin and actually receive Jesus Christ into our hearts to be our Lord and our Savior and we decide to follow Him. That's how we're saved. That's how we're born again. There are no shortcuts, but it is not too difficult for all of us to know and do the will of God. And it is God's will for every lost person to be saved. Whether they're saved or not is up to them. That's good news for us. 
Because in 1986, I finally figured out after 24 years of my life, going to church and thought because I went to church and did good things and didn't get caught doing bad things. Thought because I shook the preacher's hand and was water baptized as a child. Thought because I prayed every night and asked God to forgive me that I was right with God. I, like many people, thought because I grew up in the United States of America, well, everybody in America, except those that are in jail, or got long hair, or look different than me, are saved. How foolish is all that? But that's how our thinking is outside the Word of God. We, we have our own version of salvation. We have our own version of heaven. We have our own version of God. But how many know, I thank God, <clears throat> that 37 years ago, I found it God's version of God. And I accepted His version. I repented of my version. And I came on His terms. And I was able to receive Christ. And I was saved. Just like every other lost person. The good news is, it's God's will. If you're not saved in here today, it's God's will for you to be saved. And God has done everything He possibly can to get you saved. He sent His Son. He just needed you to hear the message and believe the message in order to be saved. That's up to you. You like me rejected it possibly before you ever received it. But you don't have to. You don't have to because you can know the truth and the truth make you free. But it's God's will that you all be saved. Number two, it's God's will that if you're backslidden, you come back to God. That's God's will for every person. That means this, that if, if at one time in your life you received Christ, but you got away from Him, turned your back on God, did your own thing, forgot God and went your own way, that God, it is still God's will for you, it's still God's will that if we are backslidden to come back and return to God. Because He allows you turns in life. He, he, allows us, he, he allows us to repent and return. Can I get an amen? So repentance is good. See, a lot of times, repentance is not a bad word. The word repent actually is a compound word, means re, return. Pent is a word that we get short for the word penthouse. What is a, what is a penthouse? Penthouse is the, the highest level, something on the highest level. So when you actually repent, you return to the highest level of living that God intended for you to live in and is joining back to your not only creator, but now your Father God. So you can live the life that He called you to live. That's God's will. That's God's will. And you can experience that today. Why am I talking about all that, Pastor Chris? Because if people aren't saved, they need to know it's God's will for them. They can be saved. If they're away from God, they need to know that it's God. God wants them back. He wants them back. That's God's will. Finally, in closing, before we receive communion today, if we're saved and walking with God, which most of you are, saved and walking with God, wanting more of God, then it is God's will for the saved person to have, be spirit-filled. It is absolutely God's will for every person, to, every born-again believer to be spirit-filled the same way they were on Act, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God descended upon the group in the upper room. They came out filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. All five instances in Acts in the New Testament, when believers were filled with the Holy Ghost, I can prove to you they spoke with other tongues and the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit of God came upon them. God filled them. Tongues was just the initial evidence of them being filled. But it was for power. It was to make them powerful witnesses. And not only made them powerful witnesses, but they got a powerful prayer language which they could pray the perfect will of God and build themselves up on their most holy faith and progress as God's will is for us all to be filled with the Holy Ghost even as Rome, uh, even as Ephesians chapter 5 verse 17 and 18 says this be not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is verse 18 and be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves in Psalms, hymns, spiritual song and singing with melody in your heart unto God spirit filled people spirit filled means you're going to spill 
spill people spill. In other words, you're a witness for Christ. It gives you power to become a powerful witness. You know, that's God's will for every person. This helps you to be bold and a, a great witness. This is all the will of God for our life. Now, there's many other things that we could talk about today. Come on, praise and worship team, as you come today. I, there's many other things that we could talk about that is His Word or His will for every life. But I want to leave us before we receive communion and talk about two more today with that thought. Because what if today you're in here and there's never been a time you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Are you supposed to leave the same way you came? Are you supposed to say in your heart, well, I wish I was right with God, but I guess there's no way I could ever be. I, I could never live this Christian life. Get born again. You can. Today, God invites you. Some people sit and say, I wish God just loved me. Listen, listen. The only reason you don't know His love is because you don't know what his word said. He demonstrated. Think about this. He demonstrated. God has done, he, he's done everything to love you. He demonstrated his own love towards us. That even while Christ, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of all of our sin, of all our evil, it says that God said, I love them so much, I'm going to send my son to die so I can show them my love. Now, I know we want God just to come and hug us. Sometimes we actually feel those, that, that kind of stuff. But I want you to know, you really, people that understand what I'm talking about, experience that kind of Holy Ghost hug because they've accepted the love that God has shown man through Jesus Christ. Today, God wants you to know He loves you. And He wants you saved. If you're not, you can come to Him. Secondly, if you're away from God, God's not mad at you. Matter of fact, you ready for this one? God loves lost things. Luke chapter 15, he shared about loving. He gave an example of lost things. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. He loves lost things. Why? Because His plan is them not to stay lost, but to be found. So they can be great rejoicing. Come back today. The Scripture said He will be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and your iniquities He will remember no more. That's His will for your life if you're away from Him today. Experience His will. It's up to you. Then last but not least, today, which most of you are believers, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. But you say, you know, really, I want more of God. And I've never been filled with the Holy Ghost. That's His will. But once again, He's offering it. We must receive. It's there to help us. You know, just think about the, a, a father, a good parent, giving a child the best gift that he could possibly... Matter of fact, the gift that he needs. And then the child just walk away and say... Maybe another time, I'll get that. God is so merciful because we've all done those types of things. I say that not to condemn us. I, I, I say that to convince us that God, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. He wants this more than even you want because it will empower you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, will empower you to live this brand new life. Power you to be a witness for Christ. That's His will. Because not only did He change you, but He wants you to be a change agent in the earth. Heads about, eyes are closed, Christians praying. Father, before we receive communion today, this wonderful group of people, many who have called Your name, the name of Your Son, that Lord, Father, I pray that each person today, if there's one that, are away, that has never made Jesus the Lord of the life, today they will receive Him. If they're away, they will come back. And Lord, if they love You and they want more of You, they'll be filled. That's my prayer. Thank You for working.